Well, Billy Graham once said, it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict, God's job to judge, and my job to love. One of the most striking effects of this virus from a, from a sociological or societal standpoint, to me at least, is the way that it has brought nearly the entire world's attention into a singular focus. In other words, if you think about any given average day before this pandemic, with all of the, the drastically different countries and cultures and political and economic systems around the globe, and the endless number of unique challenges and major events affecting those individual countries and cultures on any given day, the fact that there is actually something, anything, that has the power to draw the entire world's attention to a singular focus at the same point in history is not only incredibly compelling in and of itself, but it is also incredibly rare. And the reason, the reason that should matter to us deeply is because it has also created an incredibly powerful and rare opportunity for the church to respond to something, listen, that everyone is paying attention to. Think about it. At any given point in history, the church is doing the work of the gospel, which is always powerful and always necessary and effective, but it isn't always noticed. Right? Not on a large scale, not by, uh, not by a long shot. Most of the time, most of the world's population is paying no attention whatsoever to the church, and then all of a sudden along comes a crisis that captures the world's attention which is creating needs, many of which the church is uniquely equipped to address. And listen, just so you understand, I'm not, uh, I'm not talking about capturing people's attention for the sake of good publicity. No, I'm talking about capturing people's hearts for the sake of the gospel. Because there's a, a direct correlation between how we respond to people's physical needs and their willingness to allow us to address their spiritual needs, which is precisely why uh, Jesus' sharing of the gospel was nearly always accompanied by him feeding and protecting and delivering and healing people. Because when you meet someone's immediate physical need, it often, through, of course, the work of the Holy Spirit, opens their heart to the message of the gospel, which, of course, not only addresses the physical needs, but the spiritual and eternal needs that we all have as well. And so as the world focuses its collective attention on a singularly powerful problem at this breathtakingly unique moment in history, we, the church, have perhaps a once-in-a-generation opportunity to offer a singularly powerful answer to not only what ails humanity physically, but spiritually and eternally as well, while the entire world is actually paying attention. And just in case you don't feel up to that task, just remember, God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't miscalculate anything, which means he didn't make a mistake or miscalculate the timing of creating you at this very moment in human history. You understand that, right? This is what you were created for, and not just what, but when. He specifically created you for such a time as this, which means you have a choice to make. Because God is going to accomplish His will either way, as His word demonstrates time and again. In fact, during one particularly critical time for the Israelites, while on the brink of destruction, Esther, the queen, had an opportunity at great risk to herself to try and save the Jews by approaching and speaking to the king on their behalf, which was strictly forbidden under the penalty of death unless you were first invited by the king to speak to him. And yet Esther had not been invited to speak to the king. And so after she initially resists the request from her relative Mordecai to speak to the king on the Israelites' behalf, he sends her this message. Mordecai says, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. In other words, God is going to accomplish his will one way or the other. But you and your father's house will perish, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. 
Esther 4.14. In other words, I know you're going to have to risk a lot in order to help save God's people, but that is precisely why he created you at this moment in history. So don't blow it. Don't miss your once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to help bring salvation to God's people. That's what you were created for, for such a time as this. And likewise, it's the same for us today. You are here on this earth precisely when you're supposed to be here, which means whether you like it or not, you are a part of the equation, a part of his plan to provide salvation to a world full of people who are not only lost, but maybe for the first and only time in their lives because of this crisis, they're open to the gospel. I mean, what an unbelievably powerful and rare opportunity that we have right now to point people to Jesus on a massive scale. How? By serving them more than we serve ourselves, even in our own time of need, and by making the most of everything he's given us as we share the love of Christ with a world full of people who are grasping for answers. It's sort of like, this is what we've been training for. This is the mission we're being sent on. Uh, Let's not blow it. Let's not miss this opportunity, this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be a part of ushering in what could be vast numbers of people like we've never seen before all around the world turning their lives over to Christ. Okay, you were created for such a time as this, and it's what we have such a timely example of in our story today as we continue our sermon series, working our way through the book of 1 Samuel, where the story focuses on these four different people who are all at very different places in their lives in terms of taking uh, responsibility for the time they've been given on this earth, and in turn, uh, their commitment, or lack of commitment as the case may be, to making the most of it while they can. And as you might expect, there's a stark contrast in the results uh, those four lives have on the people around them, even on a large scale, as we're going to see. So let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. If you have your Bibles with you, and we're going to pick the story up where we left off last week and see how, uh, listen, what may appear to be your darkest hour can actually become your finest hour. When you understand that this moment in time, no matter what is happening, this is exactly the moment that you were created and gifted and equipped, not only to live in, but to thrive in. We'll begin at 1 Samuel 2, verses 12 through 21. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, He would say, no, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make uh, for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord, so then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters, and the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. So over the past two weeks, through the first chapter and a half of this book, the story has focused on Hannah and how God, in his perfect timing through great times of trouble and distress in her own life, how he brings Samuel into the picture who will grow up in the service of the temple and of the high priest and ultimately, of course, in service to God as the last great judge in Israel, which is where the story picks up here as we begin to learn about the environment that Samuel is growing up in. And so we're told that Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, the high priest who serve as priests themselves at the tabernacle and would have been like uh, older brothers to Samuel, they, they were worthless men. 
which is the phrase uh, Bain Belial in the Hebrew, in the ancient Hebrew. It literally means sons of Belial. Okay, Belial was a pagan god. And in the New Testament, the ancient Greek version of the same phrase was used to refer to anyone who was considered to be the antithesis of the Christ. Okay, these were the priests in charge of the worship of God by the people of God. There was no greater responsibility in all of Israel, and yet according to verse 12, they did not know the Lord, which explains their outrageous violations of God's holy laws concerning their worship of Him. Okay, According to the, uh, the Mosaic law, when the sacrifices were brought to the tabernacle, a portion was to be given to God, a portion was to be given to the priest, and a portion was to be kept by the one who brought the offering. And more specifically, the priest was to receive a part of the breast and the shoulder of the animal being sacrificed, which was clearly laid out in Leviticus 7, 28 through 36, also chapter 10, verses 12 through 15, also in Numbers 18, 17 through 19, and Deuteronomy 18, 3. But now, some 400 years after the law of Moses was given, the priestly custom had changed, and not for the better. Instead of taking the prescribed portion of the breast and shoulder, Hophni and Phinehas, and probably priests before them, were taking whatever they could bring up out of the pot with a giant fork, which probably everyone knew was wrong to begin with. And to make matters worse, everyone also knew that the fat of the sacrifice was to be burnt as an offering to the Lord first, according to Leviticus 17.6 and Numbers 18.17. God's portion was always given first. And since the fat was considered the most uh, luxurious part, the best part of the animal, the fat went to God. And again, it went first. The idea being God should always get our first and our best offerings, which really hasn't changed. But the sons of Eli were taking the portions of their choosing and they were taking it first. Even before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And of course, the raw meat was preferable because then they could, uh, first of all, they could prepare it any way they pleased. And even more desirable than that, raw meat was much easier to sell than cooked or boiled meat, which meant they could make a significant amount of extra money off of the sacrifices that were intended for God. And the people knew it was wrong, which is why they would reply, some of them, with, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish. And so in response, the priests, through their servants, would threaten the people with violence until the people gave in. This was a grossly sacrilegious practice, taking whatever part of the offerings intended for worship they wanted and serving themselves before they even considered serving the Lord and giving him whatever leftovers there might be. And it wasn't only that these brothers were not worshiping God as they should. Listen, they were causing the rest of the people of God to stumble in their own worship as well by offering unacceptable sacrifices and through greed and violence and intimidation, making others not even want to come and bring their offerings at all. And then we see in stark contrast, in verses 18 through 21, Samuel, even with all of the influence these brothers had over the worship at the tabernacle and over him, think about it, uh, Samuel was still very young. Jewish tradition tells us he was no more than 12 years old at this point, right? If that's true, well, you've got Hophni and Phinehas, these priests who clearly had tremendous influence over the people of God, and yet their continual access to and influence over Samuel, this boy, was far greater than their limited interactions with the rest of the people. And so imagine being 12 years old, away from your family since you were probably three years old, and the biggest influences in your life, the very men you're supposed to be able to emulate, are profaning the worship of God and leading the people of God to do the same. From the outside looking in, it seems like an incredibly unfair situation for Samuel to have to be raised in. After all, he's just a boy. He has no power over these crooked priests, right? He cannot control the circumstances he's living in or what he's now been exposed to. And yet all the while, this seemingly helpless boy is pointing people back to God. Certainly his parents and even Eli, the high priest himself, as we'll see. Because somewhere in the midst of the chaos and strife 
and violence and uncertainty about the future, even in his own living arrangements. Samuel seemed to understand that he was exactly where he was supposed to be, exactly when he was supposed to be there. The truth is, we know now, looking back, this is what Samuel was created for, to point the people of God back to God, even when the world around him seemed like it was coming unhinged. And what a timely example that Samuel is for all of us today with so much uncertainty about what we're dealing with and how it will affect our future, our families, our jobs, our living arrangements, our churches, the economy, our bank accounts, right? Our our entire way of life. What an example we have in Samuel, who shows us that even in the midst of tremendous uncertainty, this moment, no matter what happens in this moment, this is the moment you were created for, for such a time as this, which then raises a question that we really we really need to answer if we're going to fully realize that part that God created us to play at this moment in history. As you face the uncertainty of, of all that is happening, in our world today, how does my life point others to Jesus? Because listen, uh, if you spend more time worrying about what might happen to you tomorrow than you do pursuing what God has promised to do through you today, well, then you're probably not pointing people to Jesus. Okay, as bad as Samuel's world was becoming, As much evil as he was surrounded by and exposed to at the highest levels, growing up far from his family, far from a safe environment, far from any guarantees about what might happen to him as a part of this priestly order that was blatantly opposing God at every turn. In spite of all of that, there's no indication that Samuel was doing anything other than exactly what God created him to do. Samuel was ministering before the Lord and he grew in the presence of the Lord. That's it. He didn't allow the direction of his life to be dictated to him by the chaos in the world around him, and he didn't allow it to stop him from doing exactly what he was created to do, no matter how bad the circumstances became. And I'm telling you, we could learn a lot from this little boy because God knew when he created you that you would be living through something called the coronavirus in 2020 and he knew the effect it would have on the world around you and on your home and on your job and on your family and on your friends and on your church and on your finances and on the government and on the economy and on the hospitals and everything else and yet knowing just how bad it would all be he created you anyway do you get that He didn't speed up the process of creating you and he didn't hit the pause button until the virus was gone. No, he created you precisely when he wanted you to be alive on this earth for such a time as this. You understand? When God looked into the future and he saw this virus and all the havoc it would wreak on our world, knowing exactly what would need to be done in response so that he might be glorified in all of it, he chose you. He chose you to be his response to this world in its darkest hour. He chose you. For such a time as this, and if that, uh, if that sounds heavy, if that sounds like a profound responsibility that has been placed on your shoulders for such a time as this, well, then you're starting to get the picture because the weight of that responsibility couldn't be any more profound. But listen, as heavy as the responsibility may be, it's not complicated. It may be hard sometimes, but it's not hard to figure out. In fact, it's quite Simple, you see, you've been put here on this earth for such a time as this for one very simple reason, to glorify Jesus Christ by pointing people to him no matter what is happening in this world. We'll talk more about how you do that in a moment, but listen, we need to ask ourselves, is my life pointing people to Jesus Christ today? In spite of the viruses and recessions and all the struggles and challenges that may go along with all of that, is my life pointing people to Jesus Christ? Because that is expressly why you've been put here on this planet for such a time as this. Because this world is looking for answers right now more than perhaps any other time in our lifetime. Which means you and I, since we're the ones here now, 
We have been given the high honor and the heavy responsibility of doing just that, of pointing people to Jesus. So I'm just telling you, let, let's not blow it. Let's not miss the opportunity to point people to Jesus Christ. The entire reason we're here for such a time as this. Songwriter Aaron Gillespie once said, if I'm not pointing people to Jesus, then I'm wasting my life. Let's keep reading verses 22 through 26. Now Eli was very old and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance of the tent of meeting and he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear uh, the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow in the stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. So on top of everything else these two vile men were doing to profane the worship of Yahweh, they're now violating the women who serve at the temple as well. Exodus 38, 8 describes women who were conscripted to serve in much the same way as Levites at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And so just to be clear, uh, these women came to the tabernacle specifically to serve and worship God. And yet Hophni and Phinehas were treating them like the temple prostitutes of the pagan Canaanite religions around them. And so their father Eli comes to his sons and questions what they're doing and tells them it's not good. But notice how he stops woefully short of what he could have done and should have done. Okay, as the high priest, Eli had the authority to remove his sons from service and restore the worship at the tabernacle. But he does neither, which ends up bringing judgment, of course, not only on Hophni and Phinehas, but on Eli and his entire family line as well, as we'll see. And so everything that was intended to be dedicated to the worship of God, these priests were taking for themselves, including the women who had dedicated their lives to the service and worship of Yahweh at the tabernacle. It, I'm telling you, it didn't get any worse than this. These men whose lives were supposed to be utterly devoted to serving God and his people only served themselves. And meanwhile, the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Now, what a stark contrast. Again, what a lesson for us. With, uh, while the priests are getting it all wrong, this boy Samuel is getting it all right. He's growing not only in stature and in favor with the Lord, but also with man. Why with man? Because Samuel put others before himself, as we'll see as his story unfolds. Samuel put others before himself, unlike this entire priestly order of men and their servants who Samuel lived with, who were stealing from God and extorting people under the threat of violence and violating women in the worst of ways. And even though we know from chapter 3 that Samuel didn't know the Lord yet personally, he was learning that if he was going to fulfill his purpose in this life, that would mean ultimately pointing people to God, to Yahweh. And one of the most effective ways to do that is by putting other people before yourself, even when no one else around you is doing that. In fact, uh, in fact especially when no one else around you is doing that. Okay, In times of crisis, in times of crisis when everyone is fighting for themselves, if you will fight for others, your opportunities to point people to Jesus will skyrocket because in real times of crisis, people turn to those who are focused on helping others, which means in this time of crisis that we're facing today, we really should be asking ourselves, how does my life serve others more than myself? Because listen, our, our words matter without question. We talk about it all the time, the importance of proclaiming the gospel, our words matter, but, but it is our actions that give weight to our words. And as Christians, we talk about serving God and serving others all the time, as we should. And that sounds great until a crisis comes and our actions no longer match our words. Right? Then we create a spiritual crisis on top of a physical one. Because look, when your words and your actions are saying the same thing and you're a follower of Christ then you're pointing people to him even as you draw closer to him yourself, whether you realize it or not. 
But when your words and your actions are sending two very different messages, I'm just telling you, people will ignore your words and instead pay attention to your actions because it is your actions that are telling the truth about you. This is exactly what was happening with Hophni and Phinehas. They dressed like priests. They talked like priests. They represented themselves as priests, but their actions sent a very different message and everyone could see it and it turned people away, not only from the tabernacle, but from serving God altogether. Okay, When your actions and your words aren't saying the same thing, you will lead others away from Christ every time, whether you realize it or not. It's a fact. People will follow what you do before they will follow what you say. And so if you want people to take what you have to say seriously, then your actions had better line up with your words because you can talk about how much you love Jesus and other people all you want to. But if the majority of your life is spent loving yourself more than you love others, people will see right through your words. Right? And it's not hard to tell what matters in most people's lives, where they uh, spend their money, where they spend their time, where they spend their energy, their focus, what they talk about, what they long for, what they aspire to achieve in their lives. If it all points to Christ, then what they say about him will all line up with what they do for him and for other people. But listen, if your money and your time and your energy and your focus is largely spent on personal pursuits, people, especially those who are around you, those who see you, well, they can see all of that too. And your words won't have any weight with them. And listen, during times of crisis, all of that gets amplified. Because as Christians, we make big claims about what we believe and who we follow. We talk a lot about loving others and serving others. And when times are good, the truth is most people probably aren't even paying that much attention. But when times turn hard, the world is all of a sudden looking for the church to make good on those claims. And before you think to yourself, you know, I didn't sign up for this. Well, I hate to be the bearer of difficult news, but God signed you up for this the moment he decided that you were the best man for the job or the best woman for the job by creating you precisely when he did for such a time as this. So when you go to the store, are you only thinking about what you need? Or are you thinking about what others might need while you're there and then calling them and getting what they need for them? When you think about all that you already have, uh, 9,000 rolls of toilet paper, I don't know, whatever it is. Are you thinking about how that can take care of you and your family alone? Or are you also thinking about how that can take care of other people who may need some of what you have? Are you checking on your neighbors? Are you praying for strangers? Are you visiting those who are alone? You can do that from six feet away. Are you, are you staying connected with your small groups? Are you helping those who are older or struggling with other health issues? Are you giving to the ministry? Are you serving the body of believers and reaching out to unbelievers? When people look at you, do they see someone whose actions line up with their words? Someone who is serving other people more than they serve themselves? Or is it all about you first? Because if you want to point people to Jesus, then serving yourself is going to have to end up somewhere further down on the list. Because simply acting religious and saying all the right things, I'm telling you, that won't get you very far with people who are actually hurting and in need of help. C.S. Lewis once said, how is it that people who are quite obviously eaten up with pride can say they believe in God and appear to themselves very religious? I'm afraid it means they're worshiping an imaginary God. Let's finish the story for today. Verse 27 to the end of the chapter. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all of my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I command for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people, Israel? Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. 
Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress, you will look with envious eye on all the prosperity that shall be bestowed on Israel and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The only one of you I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out to grieve his heart and all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and shall say, please put me in one of the priest's places that I may eat a morsel of bread. So after Eli half-heartedly confronts his sons about their transgressions going right back to business as usual, an unnamed man of God, a prophet, comes to Eli and delivers a harsh but just judgment on Hophni and Phinehas and the whole family, uh, including Eli. I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel. So obviously Eli bears responsibility in the fact that he refused to make certain, which was his job, that everything he'd been given by God was being used to honor God. And when you read that phrase, why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings in both the, uh, the Septuagint, the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament, and in the Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they, they read, why then do you, and the, uh, the U is plural, so it includes all of them, why then do you look with greedy eye? So it's not just that they failed to go through the proper procedures with the sacrifices. It's not just that the traditions of the priests had gotten away from the letter of the law, which they had. But understand the severity of this judgment was for much more than that. It was the wanton abuse of all that God had entrusted them with by taking the offerings, the sacrifices, the servants at the temple and the female worshipers and using all of it for their own personal gain. And the truth is, every one of us has been given gifts and talents and resources to be used in the service of God, to bring Him glory and to point others to Him, which leads us to the third question that is so important that we ask ourselves, how does my life make the most of what God has given me? Right, which to be sure uh, is always an important question for us to ask ourselves, no matter what's happening in the world around us at any given point in history. But listen, it is in times of crisis that other people pay attention to the answer to that question more than any other time. Because again, one of the core teachings of the Christian faith is dying to ourselves so that Christ might be exalted in us. And yet if we're leveraging most of what God has given us to benefit ourselves more than anyone else, well then how does that line up with what we say We believe. This was the very problem with Eli and Hophni and Phinehas, their titles, their positions and responsibilities to God's people. Listen, everything their entire lives were structured around was supposed to point people to God when instead they were driving people away from him because of their own greed and selfishness. And as the story unfolds in the coming weeks, the harder that times become for the Israelites, the more stark the contrast becomes between this priestly family and Samuel, which is exactly what happens with professing Christians today when our country, or in this case, our world is facing hard times. Because in every age, including this one, there have been religious people who don't live out what they say they believe. They may think that what they're doing is ultimately for their own benefit by holding on to what he's given them for themselves when ultimately what they're actually doing is driving people away from God, right? Claiming, uh, claiming the name Christian means we're claiming to be like Christ. The one who gave everything, including his own life away, to save the lost. If we're claiming to be Christians, that means laying our lives down for each other, for other people. And to be honest, uh, it has been so profoundly inspiring to watch so many of you do just that 
since this latest crisis in our world began. Uh, so many of you in this church have put your own lives on hold, your own preferences, your own wants, your own desires, even from the church to go out and help other people. I've watched you buying groceries and gas cards and repairing other people's cars and giving other people's rides and extended times of prayer and counsel for one another, even if it's over Zoom or some other online uh, way, using whatever God's given you, whether it's a financial resource or a talent or a gifting and, and an ability to organize whatever it is to minister hope and provision and healing to other people, which is precisely why he's given you everything that he has. For such a time as this. Do you understand what's happening in the world right now isn't a bump in the road of your life. This is what you were created for. For such a time as this. Why? To give yourself away so that you can point other people to Jesus Christ. And I'm just telling you, the world is watching in fact, the world is watching like never before, probably in our lifetime, because this crisis has drawn the focus of nearly the entire planet onto the same thing at the same time. What a time to be alive. What an incredibly powerful and rare opportunity before us, the church, to respond to something that everyone is paying attention to. And again, we're not talking about capturing people's attention for the sake of good publicity. No, we're talking about capturing people's hearts for the sake of the gospel. What an unbelievably powerful and rare opportunity we have right now to point people to Jesus on a massive scale by serving them more than we serve ourselves and by making the most of every opportunity to share his love and everything he's given us with a world full of people who may have never been open to the gospel before now. Let's not blow it. Let's not miss it because you think you're not the right person for the job. Because the fact is, this is the reason you were created to shine the love of Christ and the life of Christ into a world that is searching for both. It is the very reason you were put here on this earth for such a time as this. Let's pray.